Welcome to the Parenting Aces podcast, part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone. And in this week's episode, we are going to be talking college tennis, but not in the way you are used to hearing on this podcast and on our website. We are speaking with, excuse me, fumbling over my words today. We are speaking with Alistair Higgum, who is based in the UK and who is the manager for the Lawn Tennis Association, which is Great Britain's version of USTA. He is the manager of the LTA's universities division. Yes, there is college tennis in the UK, and today we're going to learn all about it. We're going to hear from Alistair. Alistair has also been the team manager and the coach for the World University Games for the UK team. And again, that may be something that you recognize that sounds familiar to you because in the past, I have done articles every year during the World University Games and focused on the US team that typically goes to France and plays. And uh, one of my son's former coaches is typically one of the coaches for the U.S. team. But Alistair heads up the U.K. team and has had some great success with them. He's also an expert on match play and momentum in sport. And we're going to touch on that toward the end of the episode today. But really, our focus is going to be on college tennis. Before I bring Alistair on, just a quick reminder that if you haven't already, we'd love for you to become a premium member of Parenting Aces. You can do that by going to parentingaces.com and clicking on the join link on the top right of the page. We'd also love for you to check out our new merch in our online shop, which you can access on parentingaces.com, but you can also get to on our Facebook page and our Instagram. So with that said, I'm gonna be quiet now. I'm gonna bring Alistair on. Alistair Higgum, welcome to the pod. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. So we had a little bit of a snafu with time, and we're recording this the week after the U.S. went on daylight savings time. I messed up the time conversions, but thank you so much for being flexible and being willing to come on an hour earlier than planned. No problem at all, Lisa. We're all locked down here still anyway, <laughs> so it's not like I've got a lot of other things to do. <laughs> yeah, know that feeling. So with new guests, I always like to ask how they got started in tennis. So maybe you can give our audience a little bit of your tennis story. Sure. I began, well, I'm from the north of England, Cumbria, which uh, is mountainous and lakes. And so there's not a lot of tennis up there. Uh, but we had a new tennis club built when I was about 11 years old. And it was, I suppose there was no internet in those days. So, you, you know, the, the best thing you did was go and play tennis all day. And so I started playing down there. My parents played a bit, but they're more recreational players. They never really played competition. Uh, and then I just played with my friends. I was lucky I had a group of friends who wanted to play, played more. And the way that tennis is organized in Britain, we have counties which are smaller than your states. In fact, the whole of Britain is the size of two New York states. So we're not uh, tremendously big in size. So we have about 40, 44 counties and the counties compete against each other. And a county would be uh, bigger than a town, bigger than a city, it would have several cities in it. And the aim was always to start playing at your club and then try to get into the county team, which, um, would be like the bigger district and and getting into the bigger district uh, our small county in Cumbria was a big thing for me uh, and in those days the county coach was responsible for uh, sending out the invites to county training which then would lead to representing the county uh, and the story uh, my story is that the county coach didn't know my name or address so literally wrote on an envelope to the little red-headed boy from Wigton and left <laughs> the envelope on the table in our clubhouse <laughs> and uh, I always joke that luckily I got there before the other talented little redheaded uh, boy from our tennis club uh, and snatched it and, and went to the train. No, I'm sure it was for me, but yeah, that was the way I got into it. Um, I love so, that. Yeah, little Harry Potterish, but it's, uh, yeah, that's how it went. And so from there, you know, play more, you get you get invited to something, don't you? And you, you're more motivated and you start playing more. And then I would play, I'd go to Manchester uh, to play, which is about, a, I guess, a three-hour train ride away when I was 16, 17, 18. And I did my A-levels, which are, I guess are like SATs uh, in mm -hmm. America. 
and three days a week I was studying. Uh, and my experience. I love was, that you call them SATs. We call them SATs. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. SAT. Um, so the SATs, um, you know, they they were they were okay, but not great because I was playing so much tennis by then, and I was traveling to Manchester to play twice a week on a full time squad. Um, so doing sixty percent education, forty percent tennis, and then I went to a tennis. Uh, well, I went to a university where I played a lot of tennis, but not so much at the university at a club in Yorkshire called Ilkley. And I would play a, a, a most of my tennis then during those years between 18 and 21. And so I, I was a classic late developer and I would play a lot, enjoyed it, played full time tennis for two years after that, but was good enough to beat one or two players with world ranking, but not to get a world ranking myself. Probably at my best, I was top. 40 in the country in the men maybe top 50 um, and then went gradually went into coaching became county coach for Nottinghamshire which was further south then uh, national coach and uh, Richard Lewis who was uh, for the LTA five years for the 16s traveling all around uh, the top top tournaments in the world that year orange ball etc uh, and then into coach education which is training the coaches responsible for performance at first then the whole country and then having done that for three years left the lta to do my own work in match flow momentum tutoring coaching uh in tennis and in soccer a little bit uh but i've sort of since developing the university side the college side of tennis uh, i began that on five days a year and it moved to 60 days a year, two days a week, and now three days a week. Mm -hmm. So now I work three days a week on college tennis and then two days a week on my own projects. I love it. I love it. Do you have memories of your parents' involvement in your tennis as you were getting really good and starting to be noticed? Yeah, really, really strong. And it's a huge commitment to parents, you know, of parents to young tennis players. And it's not easy. And, I, and my mum in particular was very... You know, she was trying to find out as much as she could by reading the books and suggesting I go to different coaches. And I mean, I love tennis and it was it was difficult to really, you know, find that my parents were teachers. They were great, very, very supportive. But it was difficult because the coaching wasn't so strong. So I ended up with a lot of sources of input. And as a player, that's quite difficult. And probably I think when I got to college, they had a one single source coming my way. I'm very more, much more focused on the goals, so it was it was easier. But there's no doubt without the parental support, I wouldn't have been able to play the traveling, the traveling to training. The commitment from parents is just tremendous. It is, it is. So let's jump into this whole notion of college tennis in the UK and what the structure is. I mean, here in the US, you know, we have division one, division two, II, division three, we have NAIA, we have junior colleges. Um, do y'all have something similar? Do you have something similar to the NCAA in the UK? So the sport is organized at university level. So we call it university more than college over here. Right. So that's if I fall into saying that when you hear me say it's university okay. in college. Um, it's organized by books, which is B-U-C-S, British University Colleges Sport, the competition side is. And all the universities play all sports on a Wednesday afternoon between October, early October, all the way through to April. And they have fixtures all the way through the year in all sports. So if you go to any university in the country, there'll be soccer, there'll be rugby, there'll be cricket, there'll be tennis, there'll be athletics and swimming, all kinds of fixtures taking place. So Wednesday is the big sporting fixture day. And each university puts out teams and then is awarded what we call books points, ranking points uh, for where they finish in the league, where they finish in the knockout competitions and how well their players do individually. So in the same way that you will have um, team competitions and individual competitions, then we have the same also in, uh, in Britain. And therefore, at the end of the season, all these points added up and you can see which on the rank on the whole rankings list which university finishes top for sport in the books table uh, but then you can drill down and see who finished top, top for tennis or top for swimming or top for um team sports if you like and you can and the universities really enjoy competing for these books points which then mm -hmm. um, says where you are now 
within each sport, therefore, is then broken down into leagues. And we have a national Bucks Leagues, which has our top six men's and top six women's team in, and they compete against each other home and away. Uh, and then you, and then it goes all the way down, and you have uh, 365 teams competing against each other, and there's about 100 universities in Britain who enter teams into the tennis leagues. Now, that's all standards, and I would say at the top of our level um, is ATP and WTA. It's very high level, uh, but it's... I would say the depth in the college system is greater. So we would have 15 to 20 programs with really good programs. And then after that, it's it's mixed. Interesting. So it sounds to me from how you've described this that the universities are striving to have strong athletics programs all around, not just focused on one sport or another sport because the university as a whole gets ranked for its athletics, right? Yeah, it does. And and it's, uh, it's a Loughborough University, which is uh, quite a famous sporting university in Britain. And we have a big tennis program there. Uh, they would have won it for the last 30 years and they pride themselves on their sporting achievement. But they will produce Olympic, you know, like the colleges in the US, with Olympic athletes, Olympic swimmers, Olympic athletes, uh, Sebastian Coe, who heads up uh, the whole of the Olympics in 2012, went to Loughborough. The British team were based at Loughborough as the holding camp before 2012 Olympics in London. So there's a there's a huge sports science background to all our universities, well, a lot of our sporting universities. Uh, and they all want to do well in both. It's something that the, uh, the people who lead the universities understand. If you're mm -hmm. top 10 in books in sport, then they like that. It's a, it's a straightforward rankings list. I, it's so cool to me to think that that would then lead the athletes from the different sports to really support one another to push the university as a whole forward in the rankings. Yeah, it, it, and I, there is a great team feel to it. I mean, the, the players love the team spirit, as they do both here and in the States. Uh, and it's like every week they're heading towards as a team and competing as a team, but they're part mm -hmm. of a wider, much wide, wider team. So they'll talk to their other athletes from the other sports as they get back on a Wednesday. They'll follow each other. They'll meet in the bar and celebrate or commiserate together. Uh, and they come, just a big university feel all pushing towards and of course they have their own tennis social media but they have the sports social media and therefore they're all you know that just helps those connections very cool let's talk about what it takes to qualify to play tennis at a british university what what's the recruiting process like um i mean it's a di it's a very straightforward direct and i think generally speaking us in society would have less rules than Britain but when it comes to college tennis we have a lot less rules than you do um, so it's very straightforward we don't have eligibility criteria you can play professionally and then come and play at the university in Britain um, you, there's no uh, you can play for as many years as you like it's not that you have to play for four years uh, you just contact the university directly and then it's all about the academics. If you get in academically, and there's a range of academic standards across a range of universities, and you speak to the tennis coach, then that's the application method. It's it's no more um, straightforward. It's no less. Wow. But it is straightforward. <laughs> are there scholarships available for tennis? Um, it depends on how good players are. There's fewer scholarships available than in, in the states, and mm -hmm. so there's not. You'd have to be very good to get a free ride at a master's level. Uh, but there are some universities doing that, but mostly it's the tennis that's free. Uh, so the travel is free, the training is free, the support, the psychology support, the sports science support, that's free. And it's um, it's not the case that uh, you know there is a, a huge TV revenue from say soccer oh sorry college yeah. football uh in the states so we don't have quite that same level but i think the um the fees depending on which college you're talking about are not as expensive as many of the american college fees it depends on the on the university and what's happening at the, that moment with that course of course so are the college or the university tennis coaches, are they traveling around to tournaments to try and recruit the top players? And do they limit 
their recruiting efforts to just inside Great Britain or are they recruiting internationally? No, they recruit internationally. There's no requirement to be, uh, you know, our top league is full of international students. And uh, we've had players who are British who have come back from America. So Dan Little um, would be an example, Ella Taylor, Jack Findle Hawkins, they're all back doing master's degrees or have just done master's degrees now. Uh, and they played in, in, in the States. But also we've had some uh, US college players come and play uh, or is Finn Tierney from New Zealand, who's top 500 ATP playing at Durham. So there's there's different players who play uh, within it. In terms of recruiting, it's very often the university, for our top universities, it's the university that recruit rather than the college coach, because there's no uh, traveling budget for the co college coaches to go and recruit. Mm -hmm. So it's done a lot more over social media or via the university, uh, as in the, uh, the academic, that they're rec recruiting for all sports or for the academics, uh, you know, internationally. If an American tennis player wanted to come play and attend university in the UK, what hoops would he or she need to jump through? Are there tests that they need to take comparable to our SAT? Are there grade point requirements? Are there ranking requirements for the tennis? How does that work? Um, the, the the rankings would be done on UTR, I guess. So I mean, that's okay. a common, you know we we have that here as well. So that would be common. Um, Not the, the world tennis number. You all haven't shifted. It's coming. It's coming this September. Well, it's coming okay. now, in fact. Um, but it's not embedded yet, so probably not quite using that yet. Um, okay. but certainly, UTR is comparable. ATP, WTA, ITF. That those are all uh, understandable and comparable. Um, then after that, it's a question of really contacting the university to understand what are the entry level grades, SAT or equivalent uh, that they require. So that you know, Britain's very international, extremely international with its education, and it draws you know whether it's Oxford or Cambridge or Durham or Loughborough or Nottingham, Exeter, Bath. They're all full of international students from all over the world, China, America, India, um, as well as British students. And, and they come because the education is very good here. And also it's great to spend a year or more in Britain, whether it's in historical Bath or Durham where Harry Potter was filmed or wherever. So there's lots of um, reasons to come. But the academic departments of the universities will be therefore very familiar with what you have to achieve. But if you want to study maths at Oxford, then you're going to need higher grades than you would do at, well, I'll not mention any other universities, but there's a range <laughs> of academic levels. Sure. I, I don't know if my audience knows this. I don't think they do, but um, I actually spent a year at the University of Leeds and ah, not, not for tennis, um, but just academics. I did a junior year abroad program. Um, it, it was quite a difference. The The university system in the UK, I, you know, and I'm sure it's changed since I was there 30, I'm not even going to say how many years ago. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but at the time I was there, the whole structure was so different from the university structure here in mm -hmm. the US. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just the way classes are run, the expectations, there was a lot more self-study and um, a requirement that the students really be self-motivated. The mm -hmm. professors, you rarely had interactions with them. It was, you know, more with like a, a comparable to a, a teaching assistant here in the States would be. Um, and it, it was a bit of culture shock for me, even though the language was the same, it took me forever to pick up on the Yorkshire accent. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, is that. That's not just you, that's everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it, that's interesting. And I think that's why I had, uh, I've got two sons. One went to American college tennis and one went uh, to Brit British university tennis. And so it's been really interesting to compare and contrast. And certainly it's more structured throughout in generally the academics through America than it is here. Um, but I think there's a lot of time and uh, to study on your own here, which creates great opportunities for playing tennis as well. Because right. if you cope with being in a library later on and you can train um, twice a day, then great. And, and it's not a, it, I think being self-motivated is, is generally seen here as a, being a self-starter as a really core uh, life skill. Right, right. What does a typical day look like for a university tennis player in the UK? 
I don't think it would be much different from in the US college system. Um, so our top universities are, are training once or twice a day, depending on the university. They would have S&C on top, strength and conditioning. They would have uh, some lifestyle management that obviously be fitting in their academics. I suppose the difference is the competitive schedule, which is mostly around a Wednesday. So if they're playing on a Wednesday, they don't tend to play on a Thursday, they'll have the day off, and then they'll start building again for the next Wednesday. So it's more like your traditional, solid, regular fixture list. Um, mm. But having said that, I think we have a, a, a greater freedom and emphasis on WTA and ATP rankings here. And uh, there's a, a good domestic schedule for those tournaments. And our top players will play the big fixtures, but the universities will let them pursue their own rankings in between times. So if, if they feel they're strong enough to be, you know, one of the weaker sides, then Maya Lumsden, who plays at St University of Stirling in Scotland, she's been as high as 220 WTA. She's our number one for a British team. Uh, she would she would be on the road playing well, all over the world, South Korea, probably 20 weeks a year, as well as studying a part-time degree and playing the big matches for the university. Wow, I mean, that's a lot to take on. We, in the States, the NCAA sets limits on the number of contact hours the college coach can have with the players. Um, you know, they really put the emphasis on making sure the academic schedule is adhered to and the requirements are adhered to on paper. <laughs> <laughs> the realities are sometimes very different from that, especially for top players who do intend to pursue a professional career after college. And, you know, maybe they've been offered a, a situation at a college that allows them to come and play for one year, but also have the flexibility to play professional events in the off season and then to leave to turn pro and come back and pursue their degree at a later date. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. sounds like the system in the UK is set up to accommodate all of that while pursuing the degree at the same time. Yes. Depending on, um, you know, the situation at the university. So at Sterling University, so Johnny O'Mara, who now plays Grand Slam in the doubles, he went there for a year and, and then left to play full time. Um, people like George Houghton at Loughborough would split his final year and play and do half the year academics and then half a year playing full time. So there's lots of opportunities to do it different ways. And, and one of the difficulties I find when I'm talking to parents is the answer is anything's possible, which is a great answer, a strong answer, but it's also the worst answer because you don't end up defining something exactly uh, there. Right. So there is a, a lot of flexibility uh, within the system, depending on which course, whether it's part-time, full-time, postgraduate, undergraduate, uh, and of course, the level of academics. So if you go to Bath to study, um, well, if you go anywhere to study medicine, then you're not gonna get the same level of flexibility as if you study sports science, uh, at Leeds Beckett or Sterling or Loughborough or Bath, for example. Well, and that was going to be my next question. Are there popular courses of study for tennis players that they've kind of figured out, you know, if I go down this path academically, it's going to allow me the most flexibility and the most training time? I think sport and sports science and sports coaching is probably the most common degree that our university students will do and that's mainly because our big tennis centers are at big sport universities mm -hmm. and they've grown up with their academic Loughborough, Bath, Sterling, they've all grown up with that uh, sporting background and therefore they're used to ac uh, accommodating athletes, they, they bring science into sport uh, and it depends on the background of the university. So Exeter University which is a, has 10 indoor courts and a, and a very good tennis program down there on the south coast uh, has a teaching, a PE teaching background. So that would be sport, probably with science brought into it. Whereas Bath has more of a science background. So it's science with sport brought into it. So there's different nuances in them, but all those big sporting universities, the students who play tennis usually go to study sport, but not always. Interesting. You know, another kind of pathway for American players that I don't know if people are aware of is you can go play four years of college tennis here in the States and then you can go do graduate work in the UK and continue to play tennis for the university while you're pursuing your graduate degree. 
absolutely there's no limit so we have one boy scott duncan who plays for britain and scott's uh we always joke with him he's a perennial student i think he's been playing college tennis in here for i think it's certainly eight years it may even be nine wow. years so he's i may i may be one two years too many but it's a long time uh, and it, it is something we joke about and it, he's but he's gone from a you know, a good county player to a very good international. I think he was top 500 ATP in doubles eventually um, and still playing now. But he's mm -hmm. got uh, an undergraduate degree with some part time and extended it and done some part time split years. Then he's done a, a postgraduate degree and now he's thinking of a PhD as well, a master's degree uh, in psychology. So, yes, you can play for a long time and it's a great way of seeing another country, extending your competi competitive uh, experiences and training hard as well. Yeah, I, it's it's really fascinating to me because I think here in the US, we think we have the only college tennis system in the whole world. The best one probably overall in terms of depth and width and expanse i think at the top we, we can compare at the very top uh based on results but it's still very strong in the us but i think you know we we're hopefully bring, bringing a different element to the party yeah so for a, a junior player who is considering coming to the uk to play college tennis whether they're coming from the states or anywhere around the world what are some of the factors that they need to consider when looking at British universities and tennis specifically? Is the, I think it's about the criteria and it's probably no different than if you were looking in the States as well. And so things to consider are what, what do you want to study? What kind of coach do you want to be with? I think the coach, wherever you are, the philosophy of the coach is really, really important. Do you want somebody who's going to tell you what to do and shout at you the whole time or do you want somebody who will motivate you but also allow you to uh, follow your own goals and be a little bit more directive in designing your own play do you want somebody who's going to be a little bit more gentle or very harsh do you want somebody who's going to be at the beginning of their career and take the energy with you or perhaps a more experienced head at the end of their career then, of course, is a position in the team. Do you want to be playing at the bottom of the team and working your way up? Or do you want to come in a bit higher up and be playing the top matches straight away? And then, of course, academically, do you want to be uh, stretched academically? Or are you happy to make is – it, is it academics and then tennis, or is it tennis and then academics? Yeah. Uh, is it, are you going to – a campus university which is where everything's on campus or do you want to be in london where you know you're amongst the normal population and you'll jump onto into a, a, onto the tube as we call it the metro uh, and you go to a different part of the city perhaps for each lectures perhaps not different part of the city but you know you're, you're not on campus where it's all together mm -hmm. and then i think also we put a big emphasis on the tennis side of transferable skills so as well as the top level of playing we're also developing our workforce, a future workforce for tennis, and also using tennis as a way of developing the transferable skills. Um, so that simply by playing tennis, you're going to gain a lot of transferable skills, such as recovering from disappointment, learning to plan, learning to prepare, talking to people, you, new strangers, making friends, striving for excellence, um, working with your partner to help them through a difficult patch in doubles, uh, striving for your goals, setting your own goals, monitoring your performance, being aware of your own emotions, being aware of other emotions. So all these life skills you you get through tennis, and that makes athletes in general very, very employable. And we like to take that and use that within our centers. Um, and actually, it was a um, when I was in America one time, I saw a, a factory at a college site, and I thought, well, that's interesting what's that factory doing there and then of course it makes sense because they get the best students working in the factory they train them up the university gets a, a cutting edge industry that was an electronics industry to um have the, the students do master's degree and uh, you know apply their knowledge in real time uh, and i and i came back and i thought actually wherever we've got a tennis center in fact we've got an industry so people the universities would see it as a 
just an indoor tennis center, but actually, in a way, it's an, it is a, a sporting factory. So we have all the same possibilities, and we've developed that strongly. So the coaches, the students coach the students, the the lower level. So if you're there for the if you're there for the top playing, you're there to play and train. But we have the next level down as well, whereby those students get a chance to follow uh, an interest in whether it's coaching or performance analysis or officiating or running tournaments or running a building, sport development, tennis management. So we're looking to develop, they're passionate about tennis. They realize that it's really tough to be Wimbledon champion or get a world ranking, but they want to keep doing tennis and we want them to keep doing tennis. And, sure. you know, therefore we've got pathways and training schemes and so six of our universities are also what we call coach development centers, LTA coach development centers. So they can develop a dual career as they go through. And so I think that's important. That would be an important aspect to look at for me as well. If sure. you're going to the British university, look at one that will, there's the top ones that are at the top of our national league, but there's, there's other great opportunities if you love tennis and you're passionate about tennis and you want to work in the tennis industry. I love that. Can you explain to us how a, a university tennis match goes? Um, how many people play? What's your format? What's your scoring? How does it work? Very similar. It's two, uh, well, it's two doubles and four singles. And okay. uh, it starts, match can take around about four hours, four to six hours, depending on how it goes. Um, it can be match tie break in the third set and the doubles if, um, Sorry, in the singles, if both captains agree, but in the doubles, it's match tie break in the third set. Um, so you, you get a, a slightly shortened, but it's not fast four, it's full matches. And if it's getting tight, it'll go full third sets in the singles as well. Um, you can come away with a draw, which is a slightly unusual uh, feeling. Um, the matches have captains on court. The, a university will not just have one tennis team, and I think that's different from the States. Mm -hmm. So the University of Nottingham, uh, which is a very strong university for tennis, have 13 teams, seven men's, mm -hmm. seven men's and six women's. So if you're not in the first team, you're in the second team, and if you're not in the second team, you're in the third team, and they play every Wednesday all together. So you get this big club feel as well as an individual feel. But yes, essentially it's two doubles and four singles. Uh, and of course that adds up to an even number, so it can be a draw. Uh, and then that's the league matches. And then at, towards the end of the year, they play a knockout. So you can be, you can, you can win the league for the, whichever league you're in, there's 365 teams, but you can be national champion with your team. Then there's a knockout where it's just a straight knockout. You can be knockout champion. And then you can be individual champion. We have what's called the Bucks Individuals, which I think is like your NCAAs yeah. where you, uh, when Paul Jubb won it from Britain, that would be the yeah. same, have the same thing over here uh, where you can be national champion. And that gets you Bucks points for your university as well. Interesting. So you say two doubles and four singles, are they played simultaneously so that you have double specialists and single specialists or can the same player play both the singles and the doubles? Mostly it's the same players playing both. So there normally will be four players go per team, but sometimes five go and one's a double specialist. But the, the normal thing will be for uh, all players to play doubles. Doubles is first, singles follows. Okay. And each match counts one point so that there's a total of six points to earn over the course of the Correct. competition. Okay. Um, and how many players does a university team typically have on its roster? Well, I mean, if it's University of Nottingham with 13 teams, they'll have 70 players and they'll all train together, but it'll, it will be probably the top 12 or 20 first team, second team players that are training together. Um, okay. It depends how many teams. Most of our universities have five teams, two girls, uh, sorry, three men's, two women's would be the minimum, I would say, for the top. Most of them will have uh, four or five teams. And then after that, it's about the standard and who trains together. Uh, some universities are more sophisticated in that everybody trains together and they'll match up who wants to work on what at the same time. So if somebody, you know, with a big serve in the second team uh, is able to melt down some serves for somebody who wants to return fast serves in the first team, then that fits well. Um, 
whereas others are a bit more rigid and the first and the second team play together and the third and fourth team play together etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so there isn't st strictly speaking a, a roster per se because you can have as many players for as many teams as you have interesting and what does the university provide to the players you mentioned the travel and the coaching obviously but are they providing clothing are they providing equipment um, are they providing uh, you know post-match recovery treatments massages PT those kinds of things depends on the university but everybody will get kit everybody will get training everybody will get matches coaching balls the usual you would expect that and then it's on depending what the university is and what you know the Wednesdays with the people who are doing massage recovery it just depends what's available um, for all the teams that are going that day, some some people will have their own student who are able to help them recover. Uh, but they will all have a recovery session and they'll all be focused on the sports science aspect and the nutrition aspect because the coaches are well trained in that. Um, but the sports science support is more generic and advising probably than um, a, a physio traveling with the team. You'd have to go to the university physio more often. Got it. And you mentioned travel. So are the teams just traveling within the region? Are they traveling nationwide? Are they traveling internationally? I know with the, the World University Games, that's a different animal, but just the week to week Wednesday competition. Yeah, it's it's all over the country for the national team. Um, well, actually, probably for the top three or four leagues, you could be going from Scotland in the very north to the very south so it's all over uh, internationally they tend to do uh, camps abroad top universities may go to Spain for a camp or somewhere a bit like your spring break but it's more before the season pre-season start um, to do that and then internationally then there is a European League if you win the British League so Nottingham uh, we're thinking of going I think if you get to the semi-finals or better no if you get to semi-finals better you can play in Europe and then it depends COVID it was cancelled this year um, so Nottingham, Durham, Stirling, Loughborough in the past have all played internationally. And then occasionally we'll get a chance to go play in China. So Loughborough went to play in China um, a few years ago. Leeds Beckett did as well. Uh, that's a specific invite uh, to an invitational tournament, uh, which Loughborough won actually. They did terrifically well. Wow. There. Yeah. Very cool. Well, it sounds like there's some really interesting and really great opportunities for tennis players around the world to come to the UK, continue their education, continue developing their tennis skills, and then moving into whatever job, whatever industry is of interest to them. But certainly the universities in the UK have created this system to educate the tennis players around opportunities once they're done playing tennis but want to stay in the tennis world and I think that's really cool and I know you know we're trying to do that here in the US as well we do have these um, professional tennis management degrees now at a handful of universities in the US and um, you know this is a way for tennis players to pursue a professional pathway not on the court itself but in another yeah in another manner another manner yeah i think it's so important because we we're very lucky i've done some work in other sports and not many sports have the uh sheer amount of people working full-time in a sport where it's tremendous tennis is worldwide there's thousands and thousands of jobs and wonderful opportunity and when i started my teacher would say alistair this tennis is going nowhere it's too precarious you should get a proper job be a teacher um but that's changed now. Sport has become huge business in the last 30 years, and particularly tennis has done very well. Uh, and therefore, we have a, you know, if you're passionate about tennis, if you've been committed to tennis, if you've developed these transferable skills through tennis, you have a wonderful opportunity to work in tennis or, of course, you know, use those transferable skills to work in something else. So, yeah, sure. we're, we're very keen not just to have the top players, but to have anybody who's passionate about tennis because they could be the next chief executive of a big tennis industry. There you go, there you go. I wanna just throw up on the screen a link to the LTA's university webpage. So it's lta.org.uk 
slash universities for those of you not watching the video version here. <laughs> um, uh, but for those of you watching the video version, the link's up on your screen and you can get more information. There's uh, some videos up on that website and other information on getting involved in the university tennis program in the UK. That's right. Yeah. And uh, there's a, a second page with all the contacts of the universities on there as well. Awesome. Awesome. So I want to segue, Alistair, into the other hat that you wear because you said you split your week between the college tennis work and the work you do with the LTA and your own personal work. And I'm just going to throw your personal website up there. It's coachingedgeuk.com. And you mentioned earlier, and I think I mentioned in the intro, that you're an expert on match play and momentum. And so let's talk a little bit about what that is, what it means, and how you help players and families that are in junior tennis. I mean, as a coach growing up, I particularly came interested in uh, winning matches and um, watching <laughs> sport. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? And I right. think that I was trained as a coach and trained in all the usual coach ways, percentage of first serves, are you attacking with a forehand? How good are your defense? How are you in the short ball? All the usual things. And eventually I start talking to the parents and the parents would um, unusually tend to watch separately. I don't know if you've noticed that, but mothers and fathers, if they watch, they don't often watch together. But anyway, yeah. when we all come together, <laughs> when we all come together after the match and everybody's calmed down a little bit, I'd say, what did you think? And they were not talking about attacking the short, short ball or the percentage of first serves, they were saying they were playing very well until that bad line call. They were playing well until they broke a string in the favorite racket, until their hair bubble fell out, until their best friend came to play on the next court, until the national coach came to watch, until that missed volley on top of the net. He never recovered after that. And for a good few months, I sort of wonder if we were watching different matches. But then after a while, it became obvious the parents knew more than or you know they were tuned into i'm not going to say the new mom they're tuned in better <laughs> they, were tuned in better. they knew differently they knew diff thank you lisa they knew differently and uh they were tuned into the emotion of them of their um, sons and daughters and how they were feeling and they were spotting patterns in the match and they were spotting patterns in the behavior of their sons and daughters so this became fascinating and you start watching tennis and you, you think, well, even for the top matches, there are runs of games. There are periods where you would describe as a good patch and a bad patch. And there are identifiable turning points. So you can see what's happening when the match is running one way. It's developing for one player or one team. And then something happens and it starts to run the other way. Now, this is momentum. And the momentum... It undoubtedly comes from the feeling, uh, the, the description that we put to a snowball or a runaway train, something gathering an unstoppable force heading in one direction. Uh, and it doesn't mean, unlike a snowball and a train, sport is different because it can turn around. So the train could be running down a train track, but in sport it can just be upended and turn the other way. Yeah. And you can, if you're not wise to it, you can get super excited and carried away about how well your player is playing. And then suddenly it seems like the wheels have come off and it's all turned on its head and what on earth is happening. Um, and, and therefore what we've, you know, it's been 30 years of thinking about this and structuring it and in writing an e-learning course, which is on the website there with a sports psychologist, Anna Suarez, who's a, a very experienced sports psychologist in tennis and soccer. Um, then we wanted to design the online learning course for people all over the world to understand what was going on in sport, in tennis particularly, when things are swinging one way or another, and then move from understanding to how you can respond to these match events. So everything that we do is tactical and mental. So whilst uh, you know we do work with our players technically, it's not what you need in a match. The things which you can consciously change in a match are your tactical approach and your mental approach. And therefore, that's why I've worked with Anna, who's a sports psychologist, because then we can intertwine the two. I think when, when coaches and sports psychologists work separately, they tend to work in a bubble, and it's not necessarily applied to the match. 
Whereas if you can see the good patches and you can read the good patches, if you can accept them, understand what's happening in them, then you can extend them for longer. And if you can accept the bad patches and recover quick, quicker, then they last for less time. So it's, it's understanding the movement in the match and that's what match flow and momentum is. I love that. It's it's funny. I watch a lot of tennis on TV and, you know, we hear commentators quite often say, OK, remember this shot, because we're going to watch and see if the momentum shifts moving forward from this. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, the commentators pick up on that. And it's caused me as a tennis fan to pick up on that and to watch for that. I certainly watched for it and noticed it quite often when I was watching my own child play. Um, you know, it's it's harder when you yourself are on the court as the player trying mm -hmm. to pick up on these turning points or potential turning points and do what's necessary to keep the momentum in in your favor as opposed to letting it shift to your opponent yeah it, it is it is harder and it, i think but it helps to understand it and then you can start to deal with it and deal with it better um a, a famous coach in britain's called keith reynolds and when discussing it recently with keith he said well the thing is that players and parents should understand if they're going to swim in a river there's a current in the river and if they're not aware of the current they're going to be in trouble and I yeah. thought that that was as near as I've ever heard to somebody explaining why it's so important. Um, because if you don't, if you're just playing in your own bubble and you're not understanding what's going on the other side of the net and how they're thinking and seeing things through their eyes, then you're going to be in trouble. And sometimes as an international captain, if I feel sitting on the court with our players and we're playing an international match and I'm feeling it's not quite going as I want it to go, but I don't quite understand what's going on. I try to imagine strongly that I'm supporting the opposition and see things through their captain's eyes. What are they concerned about? Well, uh, you know, and then you start thinking, I, if I bet my house and all my money on them winning, where am I concerned? <laughs> and, yeah. um, and if you really imagine it, you can you can actually see things in a different way. And you see that actually, oh, they've just missed two game points. They may not be feeling so great. Will they be able to hold this level the whole time? Uh, you know, they've just missed that volley. Is that going to change things? So you start to see things more optimistically when you understand how a match can go. Yeah, I love that. One of the things we're seeing a lot in professional tennis and certainly what happens on the pro tour starts to trickle down into college and junior tennis as well mm -hmm. is kind of a manipulation of momentum by yep. using bathroom breaks, medical timeouts, yep. uh, things of that ilk and you know i have pretty strong feelings about that and it's it's funny i i talked to my dad about it my dad is of the mindset because he's in his 80s and he's been playing tennis his entire life if you're too sick to play or if you're too hurt to play you know that's something that requires a doctor or a physio to come on court then you're done you you lose the match that's that's it you don't get a chance to get better you know, to heal or to recover and then continue playing the match. It's mm -hmm. That's not how it should work, but yeah. that's exactly how it works now. Mm -hmm. And I think people are, uh, you know, the, the suspicion and the reality is people are taking advantage of those things. Yeah, so that, for sure. Until the authorities come up with a rule or until your dad's in charge of the whole of tennis and can enforce <laughs> that rule, um, then all we can do is we can we can come up with solutions and understand what's going on. So if you if you take the toilet break example, it's as if you and I are having a race and that you're you know we've got both going as fast as we can and you're winning and I go Lisa stop 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 and you start to slow down and go what and then just as you're slowing down I go go and I'm off and I've right. overtaken. And that's what's happening during a toilet break. So if you if you know that, because when when they go for the toilet break, they're getting a chance to recover mentally. They're getting the, uh, you know, perhaps having a, a splash of the face with some water, have a drink, exactly. relax. You're sitting there thinking, I'm winning, and looking around, thinking, getting distracted and going cold. Your muscles are going cold, and then you start to glance, and they're not back after five minutes and six minutes, and you're starting to get frustrated. And that brings your performance down. So in the course, right. we use a graphic, which is uh, like a battery that you might see on your iPhone. And uh, where where is your performance going up and down? And, and it can start to drop 
and drop and drop in that situation whilst theirs is filling up. And you, when you get that double change in performance, that's when momentum shifts. So if you know all that, then it can lead to some simple strategies that, you know, first of all, you have to accept it. Secondly, keep warm, review your tactics, get get ready to be, you know, go on the B of the bang, as the athletes say. But also the other simple thing is if they go for a toilet break, you just follow them straight away. If, uh, you know, so you get the same benefit they do and be ready for them to say go and you say go and be fast out of the blocks because it's a, it's a, it's definitely a desperate ploy by them. They wouldn't be doing it if they were winning. Right. And we see that a lot, uh, especially in junior matches at, if they split sets, right? We see, or the person who's lost the first set all of a sudden has an injury or all of a sudden needs the bathroom break. It's never the player that's won the set that is calling for that, right? Momentum, that's right. And Well, I mean, fun, you know, there's, lo there's lots, we explain all these things in the course, but I mean, fundamentally what's happening is there's energy on the pitch and it's going the way of one player. So the other player's trying to kill the energy on, on the court, I should say not pitch uh yeah. so you know the, there is a there are some strategies you can use um but it's the main thing is to accept it if you're only thinking it's about forehands and backhands then it's it's not it's about recovering from line calls it's about dealing with these toilet breaks it's about not playing with your favorite racket and if you actually one of the things that we asked people to do in the presentation is to count how many matches they've played in their life and you'd be astonished. I've done the, I did this in America at the ITA conference uh, two years ago, and there was some very experienced coaches and players in the room. And well, actually, I did it with the LTA coach, co coaches, uh, performance coaches uh, earlier on this year, and we reckon we had eighty thousand matches on that Zoom call when we added them all. Up. Eighty thousand matches of experience. But in the ITA conference, I guess there would be more than that, even if we'd done it that way. But anyway, it's an exercise you can do. Add up how many matches you've played in your career, in your life, competitive matches. Take time. Is it 100, 150, maybe, no, probably 100 matches a year for those few years? And then I didn't play so much. It was 40 a year. And then oh, not so much recently. And then, and you come up with a figure. And then you ask yourself, how many of those matches went good, very good, great game over? As in purple patch, no problem with toilet breaks, played great all the way through, never missed a shot, didn't get anything unlucky happen. And it was great. And I think if you do the figures, you'll find it's uh, not very many where it went. Yeah, I was going to say you could probably count on one hand, right? On one hand, that's right. Yeah. So if you then do the stats and you go, well, let's say it's 10 matches that you played as well as you want and you've played 1,000, then 10 out of 1,000 as a percentage is 0 0.1. Right. And so I can't tell you anything about your next match except turning it on its head with 99.9% .9 certainty it's not going to go good, very good, great game over. Yeah. So therefore, you better get used to all these different flows, the good patches, the bad patches, the turning points, the game points missed. And then when you understand the scoring system and how it can change things because it's a three-tiered scoring system, points make games and games make sets, sets make matches, that doesn't happen in any of the sport. Maybe darts, maybe pool or snooker as we call it here, but that's it. Not, nothing three-tiered like that. So you're asked to start again all the time. You get a game point, goes to love all. You might have a set point, goes to love all. I mean, can you imagine that in American football? Goes back to love all after every... You know, in basketball, time out, back to love all. You've won that bit. Now we'll play another bit, see who wins this bit. It's a very unusual sport. So when you understand all that and accept all that, then you you know, you know, you know you're in a challenging sport and you're better placed uh, to come up with some strategies to solve those problems. And those strategies that you come up with are life lessons that you then take out into your adult way of making a living in the world or functioning in the world. And this is why tennis is so amazing. And it's a sport that every kid should get exposed to in, in some way. Agreed, couldn't agree more. I mean, all those life skills and the journey, I mean, we have a saying within our British team, the journey is the prize. So when you get there, it's not the cup, it's actually the journey you've been on and the things that have gone wrong. And uh, Joe Salisbury was in our team in 2015 at uh, the World University Games, and he uh, forgot, his, he lost his shoes before the match. So he won, them in, in, he won the gold medal in my shoes, playing with half side <laughs> Ruby. And it's things like that that you remember. Joe's gone yeah. to be number two last year in doubles ATP. 
but it's things like that you remember. It's not, uh, you know, you, you remember holding the medal or the trophy, but it's all the little things happened along the way. And that's in a tennis match, if you take time to reflect on what happened during the match and the good good things you did that you've never done before, won or win or lose, then you'd be developing and getting better match to match. I love it. Well, Alistair Higgum, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. I hope you'll come back. And we it's been to really interesting to learn more about the UK college system, university system. I have to get my terminology correct, but um, thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks very much for having me. To my listeners and viewers, thank you so much for tuning in. We will catch you next time on Parenting Aces.